Okay, today we talk about memories. Uh, I would like to start with these uh, uh, numbers, just to have an idea of the impact of memories on the total market of integrated circuits. So in, in this uh, um, uh, figure, you see the worldwide capacity by product type. It's uh, from 2012, so it's not really recent, but it's uh, I mean, more or less the, the, the um, fractions are the same. We are talking now in installed monthly capacity in equivalent wafers. So it's really the number of uh, wafers per product type. Uh, which is not exactly the same as, uh, uh, for example, the, the same breakdown in terms of dollars, because different products can have different costs with respect to the to the area. But you can see here that the larger the largest part is memory; it's about one third of the total. Right? Then we have this foundry it's the orange part is one fourth of the total and this is more or less uh, uh, application specific ICs or partially other categories so it's not really w one could also remove this part then we have the microprocessors wh which is this part then the logic logic chips so so logic but not micro and then the analog part but you can see that in terms of Category memory is the largest category when we consider the number of wafers per year. It's one third of the total. Uh, when these chips are fabricated, also that is interesting to, to check. Let's see it together. And uh, this is the same data in a breakdown by area. So uh, this is Americas, so North and South America, Europe, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, China, rest of the world. You can see that Taiwan is extremely small, but it's, it's so important for IC manufacturing that it's a category by itself, as is Korea. And if you look at, uh, there are a few things that, you sh that, that let, let's say, are pretty striking. If you look at memory, you can see that most of the memories are fabricated in Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. Oh, the rest is more or less negligible. That is the place where memory are fabricated. And uh, uh, for example, if you look at microprocessors, most of the microprocessors are fabricated in, in, in the US, actually. And uh, uh, the largest part of this number is uh, uh, made of uh, uh, Intel microprocessors that are mostly fabricated in the US. Then the foundry part, it's more or less all concentrated in Taiwan. And, uh, and for example, if you look here, for in Europe, we have a good part, a, a good, let's say, percentage of analog and this is especially in Italy, and uh, microprocessors for specific applications, for example, for automotive applications. And uh, yeah, both in Italy, France, and Germany, this is a huge component. But still, uh, in Taiwan, which is a small country, we have uh, uh, more than 20% of the whole number, of the total number of wafers fabricated there. If you sum up uh, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, you have more than half of the total. I know, and Taiwan, you know, this is also interesting. If you look at just at Taiwan, you have three times the number of wafers that are fabricated in Europe. Okay. Right. So, uh, I would like to uh, discuss a bit about memories now and uh, uh, about the, the different types of memory that we can have in an electronic system. Uh, we have 
three main types of memories we have DRAMs so dynamic RAM and then we have SRAM well, the SRAM is mostly used in the cache in cache L1, L2 and L3 of a microprocessor plus in the in the registers if there are any in the FIFO if there are any we have SRAMs in the buffers we have SRAMs everywhere we need the speed Okay, if you remember, you have already, uh, let's say, um, meet, you have already met the, the, the DRAM and SRAM during the, the, the basic course in electronics. Uh, with SRAM, you have a higher power consumption, but a faster speed. With DRAM, you have a lower power consumption, but uh, uh, you have uh, longer read and write times. These two types of memories are volatile memories. Which means that the information on the memory uh, is uh, erased when the power supply is switched off. And then you have the volatile memories, the, the non-volatile memories, sorry, non-volatile memories and the main product categories in in the non-volatile memories are now flash memories which are based in ROMs in uh, uh, flash cards and also in SSD in solid state disks and then you have the magnetic memories which are basically the, in the hard drives okay the flash memories are uh, a, a chip or a module of integrated chips integrated circuits the magnetic memories are typically in a disk of course since in this course we focus on uh, smartphones and we have said we ju just consider the flash memories uh, as non-volatile memories but the hard drives are I mean um, now disappearing it, it will be I mean a slow process but the, the impact of hard disk drives is already uh, going down okay Let's start with uh, the volatile memories and let's look at some aspects that probably you have already seen but we, we should go in some more detail here. So, both DRAM and SRAM are a type of random access memory. You know, what's the the main uh, um, characteristic of a random access memory basically you have here an array then you have a word decoder here which is also called a row decoder And then you have here another block which is a bit line decoder <laughs> uh, 
in the bit line decoder you also have the sense amplifiers and the output buffers because from this block you uh, extract the content of the memory so from the word coder so we have some address as input My, uh, no I don't want to indicate uh, uh, all the, the all the pins just the most important ones related to the array because otherwise the, the let's say the, the picture becomes too complex here we have the different word lines which go through the array as rows so this is a word line or also called a row line and then from the decoder we have the bit lines that go in the vertical direction through the array so this is a bit line also called a column line the output exit from here Outputs. here when we have the the crossing of a word line with a bit line we have uh, the memory cell memory cell at the intersection so at each crossing point we have a memory cell and in this way the total array is formed this as you know is is called two-dimensional um, addressing and what's the role of the row decoder basically there is uh, uh, let, 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 let's write it in terms of action the row decoder latches the address then decodes the word and then buffers the word line this is important the buffering of the word line because the word line is going to be long and uh, so it will let's say represent a significant uh, uh, load especially from the uh, capacitance point of view so you need buffers at the output of the decoder in order to uh, to conserve the proper voltage on the word line uh, this is more or less the same thing that the bit line decoder does so it has to latch the address so latches the address of the bit line then decodes the bit line then senses because we have the sense amplifier senses the voltage and restores the full logic uh, values of the voltage and then buffers the output
Okay, you have already seen this structure. I now want to go a little bit into the detail. Let's focus now on the bit line and let's consider um, the uh, capacitive load on the bit line. The, uh, let us assume that this is a cross-section of the bit line so this is the bit line it's a, it's a metal line typically it's metal 1 metal 1 means the lower level of metal interconnections and it runs on the substrate and it is separated from the substrate by a dielectric So this is the cross section. Okay. Regarding the metal line, we typically know the capacitance per unit area of the metal line. This is the capacitance capacitance per unit area with respect to the substrate because of course we have a metal plane and then we have the substrate with, with, which is uh, conducting and so we can think in terms of a, a parallel plate uh, capacitor and a reasonable number a typical number for this capacitance is a hundred attofarads per micron squared okay an attofarad this Atto means 10 to the minus 18. Okay, so the bit line is uh, long because it has to run across the whole array. So a typical ah, this is, uh, it's difficult to make a <laughs> proper okay. A typical bit line, let's say, might have a length of uh, 100 micron. Okay, let, let, let's put some numbers in order to understand what are the numbers we can have and the width uh, of 0 0.1 micron. Okay, so it's very narrow and very long. So we can compute the uh, total capacitance uh, easily. It is just, uh, uh, let's say, C wire is L times W times C sup. And then it's 100 micron times 0 0.1 micron times 100 attofarad. Okay, so this becomes uh, 1000 attofarad, which is 1 femtofarad. So femto means 10 to the minus 15. I'm just, let's say, reminding you these uh, uh, prefixes because probably, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with those, but so a femtofarad, this is called atto, okay? This is called F is for femto, which means 10 to the minus 15. Okay, this is the uh, capacitance of the wire. Then, in addition to that, you have to consider the fact that there are these uh, cells at each crossing point, and each bit line has to cross a lot of uh, uh, single cells. And what's happening? For example, you know that in the case of a DRAM, you have at each crossing point uh, this structure. You have a transistor and a capacitor. This would be the bit line. So you see here, you have a contact between the bit line and the drain of the MOSFET. So in practice, this is something like this if i draw again the cross section when you have in 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 a different situation when you do not have the contact you see the the picture that i've shown you before when you have the contact you typically have the contact so you have a via via it's written via so uh, uh, a via a via is a contact through the oxide from the metal line to the substrate 
and then you have the M plus doping region of the drain contact. So this is this is the metal. The substrate is P type, and of course here you have an, an M plus P region. This is uh, uh, in normal condition when the MOSFET is not conducting has a, a capacitance and typically let's say that the ca contact per capacitance is something like uh, C contact is something like 0 0.4 femtofarad so let's put some numbers let's assume that you have a distance between between uh, um, uh, MOSFETs of 400 nanometers then in a hundred micron you, uh, how many in the number of uh, transistors is a uh, hundred micron divided by 0 0.4 micron 400 nanometers 0 0.4 micron so it becomes 250 transistors each transistor has a contact of 0 0.4 femtofarad. All the capacitances are in series because they are on the same metal line. So the total capacitance of the bit line is C wire plus 250 times C contact. And this is 101 femtofarad. Okay, 250 times 0 0.4 is 100, plus 1 is 101. And this is the reasonable number for a capacitance of a wire. So in practice you have the wire, and then you have a con one contact, two contact, three contact, and each contact is separated by the following one by 400 nanometers, and then you have a total of 250 contacts. So this is to say, uh, the lo of course, you can see a few things. The longer you, you make the bit line, the higher the capacitance. And the higher the capacitance, uh, as we shall see, the higher the power consumption and the slower is the speed of the, of the memory. So this is something that has to be taken into account. Uh, in, in this situation I did the uh, I, I actually made the example of a DRAM but of course for an SRAM the situation would be completely uh, would be very similar le le let me just show you side by side both cases for the DRAM you have this thing you have the bit line I'm drawing just one crossing okay and then here we have the MOSFET and the capacitor and this is the word line then of course the word line continues for the other crossing and the bit line also continues for the other crossing if we if we consider what we have said up to now from here to ground we have a capacitance equal to c bit line of the order of 100 femtofarad as we have computed here this is the capacitance of the single memory cell let's call it cmem you know what's the problem here of course with dram you, you already seen the problem this cmem is typically much smaller than the c of the bit line and therefore when you switch the mosfet on and you want to read the voltage on cmem actually what you have is that there's a charge sharing between the capacitance of the memory and the capacitance of the bit line and the voltage that you see on the bit line is much smaller than the voltage that was on the memory and then you have to let's say extract this value and interpret the logical uh, content of the memory so this is a very specific problem of DRAMs for SRAM the situation is very very similar because we have uh, uh, the, the, this situation of course 
here we have VDD, then we have uh, yeah, then we have a latch with four transistors. <coughs> I'm going fast on these uh, plots because you should already know these things but if you do not remember them totally please go back to your uh, notes because if you I, I'm, I'm going to consider these things done done here you have the latch the latch then you have the access transistors to the latch and these are controlled by the word line so this is the word line which controls the access to the latch and then continues to the other cells and then you have the bit line here and in the case of uh, SRAMs you also have the bit line negated okay <coughs> please consider that in this situation you have to add the bit line capacitance on this side C bit line and the bit line capacitance of the other line so what's the situation now uh, let's consider the reading operation so the latch is in is in one of the two stable states at some point you uh, let's say mm, move up you activate the word line which means you have a high voltage on the word line so these two pass transistors are on and then you should be able to read on the bit line the voltage that was on the latch okay here the problem again is that you have this large capacitance on the bit line but there's an advantage with respect to the DRAM, to the DRAM because the latch has a power supply so the, uh, uh, there's no uh, I mean you, ha you do not have the problem of the charge sharing that you had with the DRAM because you can keep this voltage high for example let's assume that this is high if uh, the MOSFET is on then you can actually charge the capacitance and move the bit line to a high voltage value okay so now the problem is a little bit different with respect to the previous case it's a problem just of speed you can move the voltage up because you have a power supply that can bring the voltage up but in practice you need uh, some let's say acceleration because since the bit line vo capacitance is not small if you do not use any acceleration you would have a very slow movement of the voltage on the bit line okay let's assume that the bit line is low and this is high you have to charge the capacitor in order to move the bit line voltage to a high value now so for both of these situations we need something that moves the bit line voltage fast and this is done with a sense amplifier So, just to fix the, the, the concept again, the sense amplifier in the case of DRAM is needed, otherwise the bit line would never reach uh, a valid voltage value. Would be always in the middle because uh, the, the, the voltage would move very, very little. In the case of the extra, you again need the sense amplifier because if you do not need the sense amplifier, the bit line would reach the proper voltage value too slowly. 
okay? Let's see what happens. So let's discuss a bit the sense amplifier, how they are done and what's, what are the most relevant issues. So in the typical situation, you have this C bit line. You move uh, uh, the bit line before reading to a voltage value of VDD half. And then when you access the memory cell, you should observe the voltage moving towards VDD, which would be one, or towards zero voltage, it would be logic zero. What happens is, is instead the following. Let's consider this is time, and this is the voltage on the bit line that is called VC, this voltage. So we start from VDD half. We start from here, just in order to, let's say, put the initial voltage exactly in the middle. Then we activate, at some point, activate the word line. This instant is important because when we activate the word line, then the cell is connected to the bit line. And then this is where the charge sharing starts to happen. In both cases, you can have one of the two following situations. You have this situation or you have this situation. So the bit line, the bit line voltage moves slightly up or slightly down. In the case of DRAM, it would just continue in this direction. In the case of SRAM, it will go slowly up to VDD full or to zero in the other case. But then you need to to introduce a sense amplifier on, in order to promptly move this voltage to VDD and this voltage to zero. So this is what happens when you introduce the sense amplifier you restore the logic values and this is absolutely important for DRAMs because if you don't do that you lo completely lose the information on the memory you have to use the sense amplifier in order to read the information and to restore the value in the memory again in the case of SRAM you only need to read the information faster so how is how, how does the sense amplifier works? Let me show you uh, an example, this, the typical situation in which we use the sense amplifier. You have uh, a, you have to add a latch to the bit line. And you can add a latch if you compare two different bit lines. Let, this, let us call this bit line bit line A and this bit line bit line B. Then let, let's assume here we have just for simplicity I consider a DRAM but it's not necessary this is a word line this is not the same array so the bit line B does not cross the same word line we have a different word line crossing the bit line B so they are not activated these two memory cells are not activated at the same time
and drawing them together for simplicity, but they are in different parts of the array. Then what we do is the following. Here we have a latch. Let me use a different color. Just then here we have a latch. The latch is connected to ground and to VDD uh, through a pass transistor. In this case, we, we have an N MOSFET, which is controlled by a sense N command. And the connection with VDD is uh, controlled by a sense P, negated command and this is VDD. Then this latch is directly connected to the bit line. Okay and now we just need to add another part of the circuit which actually has the role of putting the two bit lines at exactly at the same voltage which would be VDD half. Okay, let me use another color for this, just to, let's say, uh, identify the different uh, role of the circuit. We, we have a command which is an equalizer, and then you see when you put the equalizer uh, command high, you put the two bit lines at the same voltage and then you can put them exactly at VDD half. You can do something like this and have here VDD half. So you see what happens when you, uh, when you move up the voltage on the equalizer command you you put both the bit line a and the bit line b at vdd half at the same voltage in order to start from equilibrium and then you can start to listen <laughs> to sense the content of the capacitor and to see if the bit line moves up or if it's moved or if it moves down since you have a latch for example uh, let's assume that here you have vdd so the here you have a one this capacitor is uh, charged then you activate the word line let's consider that the other word line is not activated okay so first you move the voltage of the bit line a and b at the same value vdd half then you activate the word line since this capacitor is charged to vdd when some charge from this capacitor move to the bit line this the voltage of the bit line moves slightly to a higher value and then the latch should switch to one here and zero here because this is it is b stable so that when you just move it away from the equilibrium it goes to a a stable situation as you can see the latch is basically a, a system that uh, for which the mechanical analog would be this situation you have two stable state one and two right and the meta stable state which is exactly the one in the middle this is unstable when you just move it away from the uh, from the um, unstable state it goes in this direction or in the other one and this is what happens here so let's look at the sequence of operations. Uh, le let me just show here as a function of time what we have. Let's look here at the equalizer signal. Then we can look here at the voltage on the bit line A 
MB. Let, uh, for the B, I can use a different color. Bit line B. Then we can uh, look at uh, the voltage on the word line. Here. And then we can look at the uh, sense n and with different color sense p so again i'm just repeating what i uh what i said but just drawing the behavior let's assume that at the beginning the bit line a and the bit line b are at a different value just because you, you can never be sure Okay, and they, they can be coupled to different parts of the circuit in different ways. So there's no, let's say, uh, warranty that you have the same two, the, the, the two lines at the same voltage. And this is exactly why you need to have the equalizer signal. So at this point, for example, at this point in time, we can turn on the equalizer signal. So we move the equalizer signal on. And so we put the bit line A and the bit line B exactly at the same voltage here. This is the reason why we use the equalizer. And uh, so this can be moved down and then the voltage of course is preserved. After we have done that, we can switch the word line on and so activate the memory cell and therefore connect the memory capacitance with the bit line so let's assume that this is what we do here in this issue in this point in time we move the word line voltage to a higher value you you you, you should see that more or less the voltage at which you need to put the word line is at least VDD plus the threshold voltage of the MOSFET so this is something like VDD plus VTN it's higher than the supply voltage because you need to switch the MOSFET on then when you do that what happens uh, we, we, we were saying before that uh, we had the one stored in this cell so the bit line A moves sli slightly to a higher voltage than VDD half. So we have this situation. Bit line A moves slightly higher. And look what happens here. Um, okay, no, nothing. The, here it moves slightly higher. Bit line B does not move. because the word line is not uh, is not uh, is not moving then we move on sense n here we move on sense n and therefore the, this lower part of the latch is activated and you see what happens basically this voltage the voltage on the on, on uh, you can see when i say here this voltage is slightly higher than this voltage because they are the voltages on the bit line so this one starts to uh, starts to uh, conduct current therefore this point moves down and then it w when it starts to conduct this point moves down to zero the sense and transistor is on this one goes on this one goes to zero when this one goes to zero this one goes to the off state so in this situation when we start and we move up the sense and voltage basically the red line goes to zero through this direction and then we can move the sense P. This, uh, the, this transistor was off, so the sense P voltage was 
high because it is a p voltage then at some point we can move it down to zero so that this p transistor is switched on and therefore also the upper part of the latch is conducting and if the upper part of the latch is conducting since we have a zero voltage here this p mos is conducting and then this node goes to vdd and then we have the other situation in this at this moment the voltage on the bit line a goes to vdd you have seen what what we have basically we have restored the the voltage the proper voltage value we have read the information because on the bit line now we have vdd and but we also have vdd again on the on the capacitor of the memory and the charge in order to charge both the bit line and the memory is coming from the sense amplifier from this p transistor okay so this is exactly what we have in the case of a dram and it's more or less the same thing that we have for an sram because this part can be extremely fast If we, if we have large transistors for the sense amplifier, we can actually move everything very fast and charge in a fast way the bit line. So le let's just uh, uh, collect again, recollect again what we have done. First, we equalized the bit line, the bit lines. Then we uh, activate the word line then we move sense n and then we move sense p these are the four steps in order to perform a read operation of course it's important that one bit line is activated and the other one is not activated the other one serves just as a reference because we need to have uh, the the sense amplifier completely balanced so in, in the example that i've shown you the bit line b acts as a dummy bit line it's not connected to act to an actual memory in this case yeah, it, it acts as a bit line for example if i want to read the memory cell on the bit line b i can use the bit line a as a dummy because i do not connect it with the actual memory cells. So this uh, um, operation can be done using two different uh, types of architectures. Let me show you the, the possibilities. One is so-called open memory array. Essentially, in the case of the open memory array, you have an array here. Then here you have the sense amplifier. For example, here you have sense P. This is VDD. Here you have sense N this is ground and then for each bit line you have uh, uh, for each bit line you have the sense amplifier this is the latch okay just four of them so this is a sense amplifier which is the latch with four transistors that I've shown you before they are activated when sense n is high and sense p is low and then the bit lines are taken in this way you have another array below 
and then you use for example a bit bit line a is taken from here and bit line b is taken from here so this would be bit line a and this would be bit line b and the same for every okay and then on the horizontal direction you would have the word lines So again, you see at each crossing you have one memory cell and the two bit lines are completely independent. You make everything symmetric and it's called open memory array because it, it resembles an open book. Basically you have two pages of a book open. In the middle you have the sense amplifiers and uh, the symmetry is given by the, the architecture. The nice part uh, is that you can have very dense uh, arrays in this case because everything can be used e every crossing can be used so it will be like something like this at every crossing you have oh no, this is not nice let me use a different color just to at every crossing you have something like uh, Okay, capacitance, uh, the transistor and the capacitor at every crossing. Then the other option is the folded memory array. Which is uh, uh, simpler from some point of view. The thing is that you have uh, the, the bit lines on the same side let me put the sense p here so you have here the sense p this is vdd then you have the sense n just three should be enough and then for example you have just one array then just to use the same colors as before let me use the red for the bit line and the word you have the bit line a here bit line a here and then you have on the same side the bit line B and again okay so what's the main difference is that when you have the word line you do not have uh, a transistor for each crossing because of course you want to activate in different uh, you do not want to activate at the same time the same bit line so for example when you have this word line you want to activate only bit line a and then you have uh, something like this but then in the here you at this crossing you do not have you have no transistor you have it here for example and you do not have it here because you want to be sure that when you activate a word line only bit line A or bit line B is activated so if you want to look at the differences this is denser and of course this is less dense but 
uh, very often this is used because uh, what's the problem if the if you have uh, some noise from the substrate for adjacent parts of the chips in which you have uh, lo logic that is switching then you can have uh, some uh, uh, some uh, noise on one bit line and not on the other and then you can perform an error during the reading operation for example if you have some noise here then for example this noise can move up or down the voltage on the bit line B but has no effect on bit line A and therefore maybe you can make an error during reading because the difference is very small in the initial voltages while on the other hand, if the two bit lines is close to one another, typically if you have some substrate noise, it has the same impact on both the two bit lines. And therefore, when you look at the differences, you do not see uh, uh, an impact. Okay. So less sensitive to say substrate noise substrate noise or other disturb and this is of course more sensitive to substrate noise so you can find this type of structures easily There is one thing, one, one additional consideration that it's worth doing regarding power consumption, and is the fact that, of course, the sense amplifier needs some power to move the bit line voltage up or down. And it's relatively easy to uh, write an expression for this power because we basically have to write the following expression. This is the power consumption due to the sense amplifiers. Uh, because why I just look at this type of power consumption? Because it's the main part. And regarding the rest, for especially for the case of DRAM, the DRAM has no additional power consumption except for this, uh, um, the operation of the sense amplifier and the restoring of the information. Therefore, if you look uh, at the, this power consumption, it's of course proportional to the number of sense amplifiers, number of sense amplifiers, times the energy that you need for charging the bit line, which is the capacitance of bit line times the difference in voltage to the square. Really half is the variation of the voltage of the bit line squared. This is the energy. Energy per bit line when you want to charge and discharge. So this is the energy per bit line times the number of sense amplifiers is the energy for all for, for, for changing the, the voltage on all the bit line times the frequency at which you do it the frequency at which you perform the read operations so you should see that this is proportional to F as is normal is proportional to the square of VDD and is proportional to the bit line okay so this means the longer the bit line Since C bit line is proportional to the length, the longer the bit line, the higher the power consumption. In practice, this puts a limit to the length of the bit line.
Okay. Let us make some considerations on the layout area. In the case of the layout area, density is the main issue. So we should see what what is done to make everything as dense as possible. The most important factor is that the contact the contact to the bit line are shared between adjacent cells which means that for example if I have two word line for example and the same bit line I can write the I can write the circuit in this way okay this is the word line this is another word line and this is the bit line but in practice I do something different uh, I use what just one contact every two cell because the contacts take space so for example this is a contact the contact is uh, between the bit line and the active area of the device then let's consider this is the active area for the two transistors this is just seen from the top the layout of the transistor seen from the top this is the word line which is polysilicon because it's the gate of the transistor so this would be the word line this is the other word line so word line 1 word line 2 and then we have the capacitance the capacitance is here as we shall see the capacitance is a hole in the silicon substrate so from the top this is what you see so this is the C mem this is the capacitor of the memory cell and this is the contact the word is polysilicon it, 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 it's actually uh, let me write word line is uh, is uh, silly sided polysilicon in Italian it would be uh, uh, it would be called siliciuro di polysilicio and it, it, it's a process that allows to uh, reduce the resistance of the polysilicon uh, just again if we consider the word line you shall see that we have a large capacitance because let's assume that the word line has several crossings like this for each crossing you have uh, you have one crossing per column for each crossing you have one transistor and uh, one uh, part of the wire on the substrate so if you want to compute the total capacitance of the word line C let's say total C of the word line is the number of columns times the capacitance of the seen by the gate which is W times L where W and L are the width and the length of the gate so this would be uh, y and this would be l 
times the, the electric constant of dioxide over the thickness of dioxide so this is the gate capacitance plus the parasitic capacitance that you have when the wire goes on the uh, field oxide here so again the important thing to consider is that the total capacitance is proportional to the number of columns then the total resistance again is proportional to the number of columns because you have uh, because it, it is proportional to the to the to the length so you have the number of columns plus the resistance that you have for a single gate so times r gate so the equivalent circuit of a word line is something like this r c and the delay due to this word line is tau which is approximately r times c so it is proportional to the square of the number of columns okay and this practically puts uh, an upper bound to the number of columns that you have so we have seen before that the capacitance of the bit line puts an upper value of the on the number of rows and this rc constant the delay of the word line puts an upper bound on the value of columns so that in practice the array must be pretty limited in practice tau puts an upper bound on the number of columns tau is the delay of a word line and C mm, let's say power consumption consumption which is proportional to C bit line puts an upper bound to the number of rows in practice you typically have something like uh, practice you have something like uh, 500 rows and 500 columns this is the size of the basic array which is not that much because that would be something like uh, 500 times 500 is half a k times half a k it is uh, 256k bit so it's a small memory and this means that you have to use ways to put these small arrays together in order to build a larger memory but from the point of view of the circuit See, uh, an array larger than that is not uh, is not uh, feasible okay so, so one needs to put together different modules of that size also now this is more or less the the, um, the situation okay um, le let's look at how these uh, uh <coughs> memories are made from the point of view of the layout uh, just to put together a few things that we have seen up to now uh, I said that the open memory array is denser and actually it is uh, because you, you, you can um, have uh, 
a cell at every crossing just to understand uh, just to have an idea of how dense it is let's draw the typical situation so these are two word lines I've already drawn it already drew this before basically you have this then you have a common contact here and then you have the capacitor on the top and the capacitor on the bottom this is the active area and the bit line is uh, uh, let me use a different color for the bit line the bit line is this one basically is going this way this is the bit line okay let's draw it here this is the bit line this is the word line this is the other word line so below you have more or less the same thing so we have the other capacitor then we have another word line <coughs> then we have the other contact so you have a contact every two cells then we have the other word line I like to draw everything because we can go slower and it's better than to just let's say project the full image so here we have four cells you see four cells each cell is one transistor you have the crossing of the word line with the active area and one capacitor which is the circle okay seen from the top then you can have another cell here another bit line here and exactly the same thing here so other four cells you see it can be extremely dense and this is the let's say the the main advantage of DRAMs you can make very small capacitor from the point of view of the uh, area occupied on silicon the so-called on silicon real estate and uh, st still everything can be very complex there's a way to measure this and it's in terms of feature size typically f is called the feature size which is the size of the of any feature of the smallest feature you can have in your in your uh, in, in your layout and then if you look at this situation for example let's consider from here to here we have one two three four five and the space this is 6f in the other direction we have f and a half so so it takes 2f on this side and 6f on this side and in this space you have actually two bits so you have sf times 2f equal 12 f squared for two bits which means 6 f square per bit and this is the let's say denser situation that you have consider then when we say a pro a 45 nanometer process for example 
actually it means that f is equal to 45 nanometer so uh, the, the name of the process was the half pitch of the DRAM so this is the pitch of the DRAM the distance between two identical cells and the half pitch is f so this is the reason why f is a useful uh, way to, to let's say measure the density of the of the circuit and uh, uh, of course this is an easy way also to measure the complete uh, area occupation of a large memory you know that you need 6 f square per bit and if you know the process you can easily do the computation of course this is really approximate because you don't have just the array you also have all the peripheral circuits in order to address the array so the decoders and so on but at least it can give you a rough uh, information this is the this is the denser situation of course the things become a bit a little bit more complicated if we need to uh, use a, a folded memory array because if you remember in the folded memory array the word lines do not cross all the bit lines you do not always have a, a, a mem uh, memory L let's look at how it looks like I can go pretty fast in this situation essentially we have the first two bits with the two word lines one and two first two bits then I have the capacitor then before the other cells I have other two word lines that here do not cross anything and then I have the other two memory bits capacitance gate contact gate and capacitance then here actually I have the following thing basically uh, let me just check what to do here these two polylines come close together and these two separates and then I have a contact in the middle so now these two word lines are contacted here and I have the capacitor Let's go together. And the capacitor. Here the capacitor. Then okay, I can continue. Here I have the capacitor and so on. You see there there is a uh, the, the additional thing, the only difference is that basically I have these two word lines in addition because these two word lines are not contacting anything on this bit line, but are contacting the, the, the following bit line because I want to use the two adjacent bit lines for the comparison in the sense amplifier so the two bit lines would be this one and the other one this one and so on so this one would be bit line A and this one would be bit line B. Okay, of course I need more area per bit. I have F and F, so 2F for the pitch in the horizontal direction and for the pitch in the vertical direction if I want to look at the period from here for example to here of course I have F, 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 so F F F F F 
f f f f so 8f of course i have 8f because i have to add 2 maybe this is wrong uh, I, 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 I have essentially to add 2f for taking into account the two uh, word lines. So I have 8f times 2f, which is 16f squared per 2 bits, which is 8f squared per bit. So an area occupation which is 33% more than in the case of the open memory array. But it is just to uh, understand what are the implications of choices we make on the actual density so in this case if we use them for the memory array which is actually the most commonly used we uh, pay a price in terms of area occupation which is not small for the advantage of having a reading operation more robust to substrate noise Okay. It is uh, interesting to sorry to see uh, a, a cross section on, of one of these memory. Just to understand, l l let us look at a cross section in this direction. A cut of the of the chip to look at what, what what's happening. What, what, how are the contacts, the transistors, and the capacitors made? and actually you have something like this this is the surface of the substrate for example this is the metal line that we use for the bit line so this is the bit line let's try to connect everything together then this is the contact which is M plus. Then we have a transistor and the capacitor. The transistor is something like this. Basically, we have the gate and uh, the word line. This is the poly. This is the poly for the gate. This is the word line. This thin layer below is the dielectric, and this is, of course, the channel. And this, uh, these are spacers spacers that only serve to separate the different parts also on the other side we have the same thing we have uh, uh, the other word line this is word line is poly polysilicon okay then here we have the uh, capacitor and in the typical situation the capacitor is a trench basically we had we need to etch a trench into the silicon this is a trench capacitor In Italian, trench is trincea. So basically, we have to etch a hole into the silicon. Then, when we etch a hole, we have some doping around. Uh, no, so this region is doped. We, we have P doping, which is pretty high here. Then we have a dielectric, which is deposited in the hole. And then we have poly here. This is poly polysilicon. So instead of having, of course, a parallel plate capacitor in order to, let's say, exploit uh, the, the, uh, the space, the area more efficiently, 
we have a hole so the surface of the capacitor can become pretty high even if the area occupied is in, on, the, on the surface of the wafer is not that large and then we have some field oxide here this is FOX stays for field oxide and then on the field oxide we have the word lines that in this particular cut do not uh, do not uh, form a transistor so on this side we have the same thing again the trench the dielectric and the poly And again, this is the other word line, and this is the other word line. So you can see the same thing from the top and from the cross section. Of course, if we move uh, at another depth, uh, this, this word lines that are now on the field oxide would form a, capa a transistor and would be connected to the trench capacitor. So, uh, as you can see, this structure is extremely uh, effective from, from the point of view of area occupation. Just to uh, conclude on this aspect, um, w what do we do for larger arrays? Well, typically, if we want a one gigabit uh, memory, which is a natural requirement now, uh, we have uh, arrays uh, of maximum size of 256k so we need uh, for one gigabit uh, how many 256k we need so four it would be one four four zero nine six right 4096 256 kilobit arrays so we need to make arrays of arrays and uh, uh, typically the, the structure is the following we have the array 256k then we have the row decoder and the column decoder here then we have another row decoder, another column decoder, and then another 256K array. Then again, again, and also in the other direction, the same thing. A row decoder, another array. The column decoder, and so on. And this structure, which is of course very modular, is repeated for 4,000 times. So this column decoder, of course, also has the sense amplifiers. So, so it's all, all, all is in this block. Okay. So, uh, the area efficiency is about something like 50 60 percent so the actual array is about 56 percent of the total area then all the rest is peripheral circuits 
because we need, uh, let's say, very, very frequently row, uh, row and column decoders. Then from the positive side, we typically have banks. So the memory is organized in independent banks. which can perform different operations. Different operations at the same time. Okay. Well, the typical case is that you read uh, in one bank and then uh, in the other banks you can do a refresh operation that is needed for DRAM or in some other cases you can read different banks simultaneously it really depends on the, the let's say the organization of the peripheral circuits the typical situation for the DDR3 for example is that you can read a bank and the other banks can be refreshed at the same time in parallel so that you do not have a significant overhead for the refresh operation but it can be different for particular cases okay um. yeah I just want to uh, conclude for today by showing you something here uh, just together we can we can look at this picture this is uh, uh, an SRAM cell you do you remember we already uh, we have already seen the SRAM operation you have uh, the SRAM the single SRAM cell you have the two bit lines let me write them here this is an SRAM cell. This is a typical layout of an SRAM cell. You, if you remember, we have two bit lines, a bit line and a bit line negated, and then we have a latch. This is the, yeah, okay. I don't have much room here to do everything, but I just want to use this figure to show you uh, what we have here. Basically, this is VDD. You can see from VDD, we have the two P transistors, one and two. So, and this is a gate, so this is one transistor. And this is the other transistor. So here we have, uh, this point is this node here. Then we have the other N transistor, and this is the ground. You see? And these are connected together with this red uh, line, which is the poly, the poly connecting the two, the two uh, gates. And uh, on the other hand, we have the same thing on the other side. So this one, and these are connected together these are connected together so this is the one inverter this is the second inverter then we have the output of one inverter which is this one that is connected to the input of the next inverter this is the contact between the metal and the poly so the, the metal which is the output of this inverter with the poly which is the input of the other inverter and then we have here the, the other part so this is the circuit okay this is the latch plus we have the two pass transistors one and two to the bit line so this is the bit line and this is the bit line negated so 
the word lines are uh, the word lines are this is the word line the word line you see the word line here we have a contact which goes directly to the gate of one this transistor and the other transistor these red lines are the poly gates so if you look here so this is one and this is the other one so this is a typical the typical layout of an SRAM and this design is repeated for as many times as the number of bits that you have in the memory when everything is fabricated if you look at the chip this is what you have this is from an, an, um, um, an electron microscope this is ag again what you have and here uh, the metal lines have been removed in order to see what's underneath but again you should be able to see again the same type of structure I don't know if it's uh, if it's uh, easy for you to see the same thing but it, it, it's a nice exercise this VDS is ground let me just show it for you this is ground so this is one transistor and uh, this is the other N transistor and then this is the P transistor T4 and T3 is the other uh, no sorry this I let me just put the I, I put the thing in the because the poly are these uh, vertical stripes so uh, the transistor is here and this is the P and this is VDD this is again VDD and this is the pass transistors from the bit line and this is the word line and again this is the other pass transistor from the bit line and this is again the word line okay maybe it, it it's easier to do it uh, uh, more slowly but you can easily recognize exactly the same St this in, th in this case uh, okay we have also have the color so it's easier to recognize everything okay we stop uh, here now thank you